Wing Commander Privateer is one of my favorite games of all time. There, I said it already. It is an absolute masterpiece in many ways. But is it perfect? Of course not. And in this review I am going to explore the reasons why this is the case, and why this game has been incredibly influential for not just its genre, but open world games in general. Welcome to a new episode of Ristic Gaming. A quick overview first. Privateer was created by Chris Roberts, the maker of Star Citizen, it is part of the highly acclaimed Wing Commander series, and it was released in 1993 as a spin-off to the main series, which focused on the war between the Terran Confederation and the alien race known as the Kirrati. Privateer is quite different from the rest of the series though, as instead of taking the role of confed pilot Christopher Blair, they take the role of Grayson Burroughs, a young independent privateer. It still retains the signature flight simulator genre, of course. While the game does have an interesting storyline, it is completely optional for the player and is never required to complete it. In fact, the player may even decide to become hostile to the Confederation and become a pirate if they wish to do that. As anticipated, the game is non-linear and is set in a very large sector of space that can be explored by the player once they purchase a jump drive for their ship. To do that, you have the opportunity to make money in several different ways by trading commodities with other planets and stations, undertaking randomly generated missions from the location's computer or from the merchants and bounty hunters guilds after joining them. These two are much more reliable, as there is a chance that the location ones will not pay out in the end. In any case, these missions usually involve patrolling sectors, destroying specific pirate ships or delivering cargo to a specific place. Money in the game is crucial to upgrade your ship, since you have a moderate selection of weapons and subsystems that you can install. And here is one of the gameplay aspects I enjoy more about this game, choosing your next ship. There are only four flyable ships in the game, which compared to modern standards might seem like a limited choice. However, all four are very different and require a different playing style, which will likely change your career significantly. You start with a very mediocre ship, the Tarsus, which has quite a Spartan look. Just look at that computer keyboard over there. Isn't that nostalgic? Anyway, it also has limited slots for weapons and not so good maneuverability. Basically, it doesn't do anything well, so you will be encouraged to buy a new ship as soon as you have the money. The three possibilities are the Orion, the Centurion and the Galaxy. The Orion is an interesting ship. It's a bit bulky, not quite maneuverable and only supports two cannons, which might turn off most players but it also supports the entire range of upgrades, has a slot for a turret, and it has the most shields and hull capacity of all of them. The Galaxy is your typical freighter. It has the most room for commodities of the game, has two slots for turrets, but it is quite slow. For those who want to make lots of profit in a short amount of time though, this is perfect. Finally, we have the Centurion, which is the most heavily armed and fast ship of the game. The most obvious compromise of this one is the extremely limited cargo hold, which will limit your ways of making money to combat missions. If you'd like to proceed with the story, however, the Centurion is almost a requirement, as in the later part of the story you will face some very tough challenges that I'm not going to spoil. Regardless of what you choose, there are lots of locations to explore and missions to accomplish. Before I discuss the rest of the gameplay elements, the graphics and the audio aspects, I'd like to point out the first negative points about the game. As I said, the game was released in 1993, and in many ways it shows. There are a couple of decisions that did not quite stand the test of time. For one thing, like many contemporary games, there is no tutorial, and if you haven't read the manual, everything will look very confusing. In fact, after the intro cutscene and starting a new game, you will find yourself in a mining station with no indication whatsoever on what to do next. This is unfortunately a recurring theme, as you will never find any in-game hint on how to operate your ship, how to find and start story missions, or comparisons for your upgrades. So reading the manual is basically mandatory. There is no autosave, so you will have to remember to save very often, as any time you fly there is a chance of a difficult random encounter or something else that will result in your death. There is no option to automatically sell all your commodities, so if you have, say, 90 items, you will have to click 90 times to sell it. And because the game switches automatically to buy after you sold all your items, you risk accidentally wasting money on something you didn't want to get if you were just mashing your left click to sell all your stuff. 
and there is no buyback option in case you make a mistake like that. Occasionally I have also experienced game-breaking bugs in some missions that forced me to load a save file. For instance, during one story mission, you have to escort a ship and wait for the pilot to land on a planet, but sometimes it will just refuse to do that no matter how much time you wait. The AI doesn't fly too well and has a tendency to just crash on your ship even in the case of friendly crafts. But the most frustrating problem is without a doubt the asteroid fields. Asteroid fields wouldn't be a problem on their own. In fact, in a way they are an enjoyable challenge that forces you to fly manually instead of using the autopilot and keep you on the edge of your seat. The problem is that due to technical limitations of their time, the draw distance of the asteroids is abysmally low. That is, they just seem to spawn when they are inches from your face, and if you're flying a Centurion you have maybe one or two seconds to react at most. Sometimes they seem to even intentionally spawn in a way that will guarantee a collision, however that's probably just my impression. This can be quite frustrating, especially in the later story missions of the game, in which not only you are trying to avoid asteroids, but you are also chased by powerful enemies. The good news, however, is that my complaints for the game basically end here. Sure, I would have appreciated a bit more variety in the kinds of space stations and planets you encounter, but again, this was 1993 and it's already kind of a miracle to have all of these in a single floppy disk. The graphics are colorful and because of their style they can still be appreciated today, although the ship models can look very blurry in flight sequences. The ship's cockpits feel varied and distinct. The sound design, while a bit repetitive, convincingly conveys the right messages to the player, so you can immediately associate whether you received hits to your shields, hull, or the kind of weapon the enemy is using. The soundtrack doesn't feature much variety either, but all the tracks are memorable and appropriate for the atmosphere. Special mention goes to the conversion. What I mean by that is that whether you're playing the soundtrack using general MIDI or you're using the Sound Blaster version, it still plays great while having their own identity in terms of sound. This is not something that can be said for all games and it highlights attention to detail and care for all players regardless of what could have been their budget at the time. The flight simulation aspect feels smooth, the abundance of controls make you feel like you're always in full control of your ship, and the gunplay feels satisfying, although all the guns in the game can feel a bit slow. As always, I don't have the time to go too in-depth, but hopefully I managed to give you a good overall impression of what it is universally considered to be a fantastic game. In conclusion, this game, while certainly not perfect, is absolutely worth playing even today, especially for the very low prices it can often be found at from GOG. If you're looking forward to Star Citizen, then it is even more highly recommended, as that game is essentially a spiritual successor to Privateer. There is also an expansion available called Righteous Fire, which I might discuss in a bonus video. Until then, I hope you all enjoyed this review, and I would appreciate any like, subscribe or comment. See you next time!